The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Major support for Compass is provided by the ongoing support of the Leo P. Flynn Estate of Millbank, South Dakota. Additional support is provided by the Southwest Minnesota Private Industry Council, promoting Southwest Minnesota as a place rich with opportunity. Come for the jobs, stay for the lifestyle. More information at swmnpic.org. Hello and welcome to Compass, a production of Pioneer Public Television. I'm Les Heen, your host for Compass. This is a weekly discussion of public policy and important issues facing our viewing area. This week we will talk about how me the medical field is changing and it's thanks to the use of telemedicine in and outside of our region. We'll have representatives from Essentia Health and A-View Media and we'll talk about what communities can expect from telemedicine. We'll also talk about the impact it can have in rural areas. First, Pioneer's Laura K. Prosser takes us to SCMC, where the local hospital has started seeing some of their patients using this advanced technology. Here's Laura's report. Through wind, rain, or snow, sometimes you can't always make a doctor's appointment. But thanks to telemedicine, weather is not a challenge that it used to be. Kathy Tisdall of SCMC is a psychiatric nurse who has found that the field of psychiatry is a perfect fit for a more over-the-phone approach to healing. Kathy, welcome. Thank you. So walk me through how you conduct a session with telemedicine. Okay. I work directly with Dr. Gwen Stein, who is a psychiatrist, and I am a board-certified psychiatric nurse. And so I actually live in Fergus Falls. We both commute here. We, at this time, are using telemedicine in Traverse County in Wheaton and Big Stone County Family Services. Okay. And so at Big Stone County, we have another TV very similar to this. Mm -hmm. In Traverse County in Wheaton, I actually bring a laptop that we hook up with. And I will take my laptop computer that I work on plus there is a room that I go into and I set up video and audio and I get mine set up and the nice thing about our teamwork is that since I've been doing this for about 20 years I can be the ears the nose you know I can be the visual for what maybe Dr. Stein can't see over the video it's not perfect mm -hmm. but it is is a way to see people in the rural areas so there was a need for this. There was a need, and we have been looking for psychiatrists for several years to come to our clinic, and we just aren't finding anybody. So we have had to use telemedicine for a number of reasons. Uh, for people who, number one, maybe don't have transportation and have relied on volunteer drivers, which are few and far between. Yes. Some people have some financial issues at different times of the year and then of course our wonderful winters. So how is this program funded? Well the program is funded just through regular channels of insurance companies. The counties that we serve do have something called charity care and so each county does put money into our system so for people who cannot afford. Wow, it's a community effort to get this yes. program off the ground. So what do you hope or what do you think is next for this program? There are some people who during the six months when she's not in this office that people are a little reluctant about it. They want the, the personal touch. But I think we're gonna see more and more of this coming up. Mm -hmm. And if people will say, well, then I'm just gonna go somewhere else. Well, I know that there's telemedicine in those areas too. So 
I think we're just gonna see more and more of it. That's it for us and Morris. We're gonna go back to the studio to less and further the conversation about telemedicine. I'm producer Laura K. Prasser for Compass. And with us now to talk about the regional impact of telemedicine and how it's changing the rural medical field, we have Maureen Eidecker. Maureen is the director of telehealth for Essentia Health, and also we have with us Chief Executive Officer of AVU Media, John Goodman. John, Marcia, thanks for coming to Compass. Good to be here. Um, this is an exciting topic because telemedicine has changed so much over the last few years. I remember when it was just something that people talked about a lot. But, um, you know, Maureen, why don't you, why don't you, we'll start with you. What is really telemedicine to you, I mean, in the medical field? What, what, what is it? Well, telemedicine is a way of delivering uh, spe usually specialty uh, health care services, either from physicians or from licensed health care providers to patients. And uh, the specialist many times is in a metro or urban area, um, and the patients m many times are in the rural areas. So that is traditionally where telemedicine has taken place, is to rural settings and uh, involving specialty care. It's grown a lot in the 25, 30 years since we've been working with telemedicine, and we talked a little bit about that. But NASA, in the early 1990s, actually started to develop the equipment that now, John, 30 years later, is uh, working on making smaller and uh, more affordable. But when NASA uh, finished with their work with the astronauts, they actually brought the equipment down and, and talked to the federal government about um, actually rolling this out to rural settings because they had such a successful experience. Well, you mentioned the technology and mentioned John, and so John, I want to bring you into this. So, so tell us about your company and the technology that you use to make telemedicine happen. Uh, the goal at that time was to take these proven technologies, lower the cost, make it easier to use, and push it into the community. We wanted to extend telemedicine to nursing homes, to assisted living facilities, to private homes. We wanted to go to group homes for disabled individuals because they're very difficult to transport. Um, and we were able to do that. The key is that technology, consumer technology, the basic capability of a PC or a TV would now host telemedicine. 15, 20 years ago, that wasn't possible. But uh, if you think about a flat panel TV, a 40-inch flat, 40 flat panel sure. TV, five, six years ago, cost you 750 bucks. You can buy one now for 300. And that represents the cost curve that is coming down on this, and it's continuing. Uh, we do things today for 20% of what it cost eight years ago. Before we went on the air, you, you told me about uh, your family, children, <laughs> grandchildren, and I thought it was a great description of the fact that telemedicine for people isn't just about getting access to care in a distant area, but it may also be simply about a matter of convenience and practicality. Yeah. For my daughters to take all of their kids, I have one daughter that has a 6, 4, 2, and 0. Uh, kids just very dense. For her to take those four to a doctor for a follow-up visit that could be done through a telemedicine link is a big event. And if she can avoid that event, uh, she will do it. She is familiar with the technology. Uh, my family uses personal video conferencing to stay connected to grandkids all the time. It's just, it's common at this point. And for them, the idea of using the same technology to do a telemedicine visit to deal with a medical issue is, is a no-brainer. Yeah. And so what John is referring to really is what we call now direct to the consumer. Right. And this is like a, a whole nother tier of telemedicine and where it's going to. And um, where uh, traditionally the majority of telemedicine has been practiced between hospitals and clinics to another to another clinic or another setting or a nursing home, uh, for instance, or a mental health center, um, it hasn't typically gone too direct to the consumer's home. Right. Now, because broadband has, you know, we've actually got broadband uh, established to the point where that will work now, that's the next tier that's going to be happening. Will all services be brought right to the home? No. Probably not. No. But because some of them are quite complex and they actually need um, additional equipment, equipment that uh, uh, wouldn't be in a person's home to actually present their care. Maybe it's an otoscope. They do make home varieties of those. Uh, but maybe it's a special camera, or the nurse has to help with what's called a guided exam. 
So the nurse that's with the patient actually helps with a guided exam. She's being guided by the specialist saying, you know, a little here to the left, press a little harder, you know, those kinds of things. So, um, and, and there's also additional equipment. But the, uh, the film quality itself is very much the same. It's just very, very good. Yeah. An interesting population that I think is going to drive some innovation are the uh, the individuals in Minnesota that are all uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, some are in private homes, some are in group homes. Uh, Minnesota, at the beginning of this year, passed new telemedicine reimbursement law that was key. They will now reimburse a telemedicine visit going to a group home that is taking care of these individuals. Well, they have high medical needs, high psychological needs. They're very difficult to transport. So this is a perfect case where you can deliver a medical service, a medical consult, a follow-up visit, whatever it is, at the home, a group home or private home of a disabled individual, it saves money and is better care. You get, you get both conditions at the same time because a lot of these individuals, um, when you transport them, it's a difficult transport. Okay, so th this is just uh, is, is it's some... Way. It's a better way of doing it. It's not a secondary way. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that's that. That's really true. We'll be seeing uh, much more growth in these areas, and part of the reason why is because there's a lot of support. Mm -hmm. People understand it. Uh, providers um, understand it. Where 20 years ago there was a lot of skepticism. Now the research is done. Uh, you know, there's uh, the quality. The quality outcomes have been proven. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, the, it, was, it was like the senator said, and I, I think, John, you were in the room, mm -hmm. uh, when um, we were being spoken to, I was providing testimony for the new telemedicine law that went into effect January 1st of 2016 that says that telehealth visits will be paid the same as in-person visits. Um, and one of the senators said to the group, um, the technology is there, Minnesota citizens expect us to use it. And it, I mean, that's just really, really true. It's, it's why, why wouldn't we be using this? And as we pick up literature, there's probably um, every single medical journal you pick up now and healthcare journal uh, speaks to the fact that telemedicine is growing fast and that even up to, they predict up to one third of visits that are currently being done in person can be done by telemedicine. And will be because it rings. It it's not as costly to do it. It rings costs out of the system, and it gives the convenience like your daughters will need. One of the benefits of these technologies is you can have distant family members participate in a consult. So if you have a power of attorney or if you have a, a significant caretaker and they want to be engaged in the actual consult, whether it is medical or mental, they can be linked in through telemedicine and be an active participant. Um, that's one of the major goals of the uh, Minnesota Homestead Plan or the other programs that are looking at person-centered care. They want the person-centered care to engage the family. And this technology gives a, a new resource to do that for distant family members who otherwise wouldn't be involved at all. Which brings up an interesting idea. We've talked a little bit about the idea of diagnosis and treatment. And then there's the other piece which comes in here in Big Play, I would think, which is monitoring. Yeah, um, telehome monitoring, for instance, is one, one thing that I thought a long, uh, 20 years ago was going to take off just immediately. But it really, it really didn't. And most of the reason was because we didn't have enough broadband in people's homes. But um, one of the reasons that it's so important, telehome monitoring, and that's mon monitoring of vital signs, whether it be weight gain or blood pressure, um, glucose readings, um, is because it helps to maintain our uh, people in their homes independently uh, longer. Yep. And um, whether it's, uh, you know, one example that, that I uh, recall was from one of my first experiences with the research that we did with the University of Minnesota. And it was uh, with a lady in home care. And uh, the home care nurses would link up via video each morning at 8 o'clock to help her give her insulin because she was independent enough to do the injection, but the nurses would set up the medication like on a weekly basis, and then she would, they would observe her, remind her, and observe her, help her choose her site of injection, and she remained in her home for three additional years because of that, because she had that at eight o'clock each day, uh, the home care nurse beamed in, 
and uh, helped her do that injection. That's a huge, that's a huge savings for her and her family and her quality of life. I mean, however you want to slice that, it's just really, really important. And we're going to see more of that. Um, individuals, uh, pediatrics with in-home equipment, for instance, that's an important part of that too. Yeah, the, from a cultural standpoint, we need to extend independent living as long as we can. Yeah. And the good news is that's what people want. They, they, they don't want to move to higher levels of care. They want to maintain their independence. And these are technologies that will significantly do that. Uh, Maureen just gave you an example. I've got other examples in Winona where by providing remote monitoring and services, med management, et cetera, we extended independent living. And that's a great result. And I think the geography here is probably worth mentioning because I know, John, you have an office in Minnetonka and an office in Winona, so you're in the metro area and in southeast Minnesota, and you've got offices in western Minnesota around Graceville and in Duluth. So you're both seeing this from a statewide perspective, so it's not just a pilot project in right. one place, but it's being applied in many places really throughout the country. I'm just wondering about if someone is hearing about this for the first time. Is this the sort of thing where patients often learn about it by talking to physicians, or is it... Patients in some cases say, what about telemedicine because I'm having difficulty getting to the clinic? Yes. So if someone wants to, as, as, a, as a consumer, right. wants to know more, how do they start? Maureen? Yeah. Well, one of the things uh, the, we try to do at, at Essentia, um, there are 30 different telemedicine programs over 30 different sites, uh, hospitals and clinics. And so we try to remember, okay, this patient is from this town that does have telemedicine, if they have that specialty, we can offer them their follow-up, uh, either in person if they want to go to uh, the larger tertiary setting, or else we can offer to do it uh, via telemedicine. So it's actually traveling by that way, um, the physician to the patient. Patients are also talking about it. I think we also have more, um, we have more veterans that are using telemedicine. That's a, it's a big program for the VA and the Department of Defense. With that, I think we need to bring this to a close. It's been a great discussion. John Goodman, Marsha Eidecker, thank you very much for joining us on Compass. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it for this week on the topic of telemedicine in rural areas. Compass producer Laura K. Prosser will take it from here and end this week's episode with the next installment of the Compass Literature Corner. Thanks for watching. As part of a new segment to the show called the Compass Literature Corner, we will be talking to local authors and writers who have had an impact on this region or whom this region has had an impact on. This week's guest is a woman of prose, of poetry, and of imagery. She knows the struggle of everyday rural life and writes about it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to say that today's guest is Marshall resident Sarah Marine Rapina. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your book, Melt, Tooth, Levy, and Fever? This book was a little bit different than some others that I've, that I've worked on. This one was kind of my very first time putting together a collection. It came out in 2015, and a chapbook is just a short collection of poetry. Um, so it's about 30, 30 or so pages. It was published by a great press called Dancing Girl Press out of Chicago. And it's my first um, sort of bound collection. How did you narrow down what poems to put in your book? Right. So this, this book was a little bit different than some others that I've, that I've worked on. This one was kind of my very first time putting together a collection. Um, and so what I did was I had all these poems that I'd been writing for years and years. And I kind of started looking at them and realizing that even though they were on different topics, that they all sort of covered the same general theme, which, was, which is sort of covered in the first poem from which the name of the collection comes, mm -hmm. which is about breaking and how broken things and when things break doesn't necessarily mean that they're irreparably broken. So kind of if you think about that when you read all the poems, usually um, people find that that's the theme that runs throughout the whole thing. And then the first section covered what I think of as kind of childhood poems. I grew up in sort of a rural, very forested area. Mm -hmm. And so most of these poems are things that were inspired by things that happened in my childhood, the landscapes of my childhood, things like that. And um, 
The second section is kind of, most of those are about myth, okay. um, like stories that come from, from somewhere else, you know? A lot of Greek mythology. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of Greek mythology, and like there's a couple that are about movies that I really like. What made you insert Greek references yeah. to your poetry in your style and your prose? I mean, y you hint at it, but there's no guarantee that your reader is going to pick up at it. Right, and that's something that actually I think about a lot, and there's a couple of different things that I consider when I decide whether or not to put something in a poem, right, or to keep it in a poem, actually, so it all goes in there in the first place. Um, and one of those things that I wonder to myself is, would my grandfather understand this poem, right? If I write this poem, because my grandpa, all of my grandparents were sort of in rural areas and they were not college educated. They were miners and trappers and, you know, construction workers and things like that. Um, so, but he was really smart and he loved reading. So I always say, you know, like, would my grandpa enjoy this poem? Mm -hmm. um, and he didn't necessarily know about Greek myth, um, but he had a lot of books in his house. And so like, I sort of think that like, if he would have, um, been able to enjoy the poem, then I write the poem. Um, but then, of course, sometimes people aren't going to get it, right? Like there's one about, you know, the Persephone myth and people don't necessarily know that who Persephone is. Yeah. Um, and two things happen. One is that when I'm reading in person, I sort of tell the story really quickly. Um, but then I also kind of assume that if you're, you know, if you got my chapbook for some reason, right, um, you probably have the internet and if you're reading it, you know, like maybe you'll look it up. Very true. Yeah. And, you know, with technology right at our hands, it's easy enough to type in Persephone's yeah. or Hades yeah. and see where it leads you. And yeah. then you have context for this poem. Yeah. And they still cover, like, they sort of um, harken back to themes of rurality and, like, kind of growing up outside of um, urban society and things like that. But they're more based on other stories that didn't really originate with me. And then the third section is sort of... Um, again, returning to that idea of like a rural place, um, but kind of from a more adult perspective. With all these poems not on the same topic, mm -hmm. would you say that your inspiration comes just from whatever you run into mm -hmm. in life? Or where does your inspiration come for these poems? Right. You know, you hit on rurality, mm -hmm. you hit on, you know, your childhood, yeah. but where exactly does your inspiration come from? It comes from actually a lot of different places, right? And the only thing that I can think of that really ties all of it together is that sort of whenever I write a poem, it usually comes when, you know how when an oyster gets a pearl, it's that there's like a piece of sand that they sort of just keep putting layers and layers and layers on. And it's when I get something sort of stuck in my head and I can't get rid of it. And so I keep putting layers and layers and layers onto it. And pretty soon you're writing it down and yeah. pretty soon it's a poem. Yeah, yeah. So, and with, with, this, with this book, because it was just sort of me taking existing poems and realizing that there was a theme. Um, How is being rural a key part of this poem book? Um, well, I mean, one of the things that I've, I've realized, because I've lived in a lot of different places. I grew up in Upper Michigan. We've lived in southwestern Minnesota for a while, lived in Florida, and in rural China, actually. So I've lived in a lot of places that are both rural and urban. But no matter where I go, I kind of go back to that landscape of my childhood. Like if I'm just sitting around and thinking and picturing things, it's always sort of the forests of Upper Michigan, um, which actually looks a lot like southwestern Minnesota, except with less farmland, more trees, yeah. right? So um, southwestern Minnesota is nice for me. Um, but so I think that it really influences everything that I write, um, and I just always kind of end up coming back to um, the rural themes. Um, and one thing, because I'm in academia, I, I teach at universities, and I speak a lot at universities, um, and I think that sometimes the rural landscape gets overlooked, right? Like we're talking about cities and that's the place where all of the, um, all the art happens and all the amazing, exciting things, but there's incredible things happening, you know, in rural towns. It, it is. Yeah. That's it for us in the Compass Literature Corner. Please tune in next week for more people, places, and issues facing our viewing area. I'm Pioneer's Laura K. Prosser, and may your compass always point you in the direction of a good book. We'll leave you with Sarah reading a poem that has some Greek mythology. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. This is called Advice for Icarus. 
Air walking depends on harmonic weight. So start at the platform, open wing position, feet pivoted inward like skis afraid to run the mountain. Step with tire swing momentum. If there's wind, drop your umbrella. Planning somersaults above the Ganaraska? First, rehearse them on dry land. If you see an arrow angling, straighten the apple on your head. If you wear a blindfold, make it red. If leg irons gnaw your hamstrings, retrieve the key from your cheeks meaty hollow. To rest, braid one ankle bone tight to the wire. Ease back in standing posture. Lie still. Lie loud. Holler out to the crowd that the man hitched to your neck is sparrow light, no sweat. Then believe it. Clouds appear to waft, but they're always, always gently plummeting. When the audience roars, cast raw salmon down its mob throat. When the Niagara Gorge calls, chant this until its voice drowns. All rivers were clouds once. All clouds ache to be rivers. Major support for Compass is provided by the ongoing support of the Leo P. Flynn Estate of Millbank, South Dakota. Additional support is provided by the Southwest Minnesota Private Industry Council, promoting Southwest Minnesota as a place rich with opportunity. Come for the jobs. Stay for the lifestyle. More information at swmnpic.org.